Beloved Father, Mother God, we are grateful for thy comforting presence, for thy strength, for thy inner direction, for thy resolution within our hearts. We are grateful for guidance and thy vision. We are grateful for thy presence in us, even as we are grateful to be in thy heart. We are bearers of thy flame, even as thou bearest us up in thine arms. O thou comforting paraclete, thou holy spirit, comfort each chila on the path, that he might see and know each footstep of our Lord Jesus Christ, into which we may press our feet. Help the tiny feet, O God, who love thee so very much. Help the little ones who know their mission. Help their parents to shepherd them and protect them. We gather in this hour, O oh God, to learn of thy law of abundance. Therefore, we give gratitude for the abundant life that you have placed in our temples. We give loving obedience to the Father and the Son Therefore, we attend Jesus' promise that the Father and the Son shall take up their abode in us. Come quickly, O Father, Mother, God, and live where I am. Come quickly, O Lord Christ Jesus. Come quickly, O Universal Christ, to intensify and multiply our Holy Christ Self. Draw the ring of fire around us each one, even the solar ring and the corona of the sun. Let the great central sun magnet demagnetize from us now all fear and doubt, all anxiety. Let that be purged by rayolite's flame. Fearlessness flame come forth now. Displace the not-self. Give us the courage to embrace the real self and to move forward up the mountain of God, leaving behind the excess baggage of the lower levels. O oh God, we would be free this hour to be thy perfect chalice. Teach us, O oh Lord, to receive testing and trial, initiation, as well as the reward of the prophets and the saints whose hour has come. Above all, we give thee praise, O God. We give thee thanks that thou hast taken unto thee thy great power and hast reigned in us. O God, let thy power reign. We accept it now in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and the Divine Mother. Amen. Let us sing to Beloved Cyclopeia, number 357. We leave the doors open and I ask you to make calls to the all-seeing eye of God. I ask you to see the vision of the ray of Cyclopeia coming forth from that mighty eye. If you would like to face the eye and keep your attention riveted on the eye of God, so you may see God's eye upon you and the shaft of light descending and where you stand there does descend the city four square god has created for you an entire city of light oh the city of light let us enter it now and rejoice in the company of the saints and in those who are our elder brothers and sisters O oh, retreat of the divine mother O thou new Jerusalem, thou city of God, beware I am that I am, for I am, we are thy servant, O God. Please give your calls together.
I'd like to give you this evening some teachings on the precipitation of supply. These are taken from the book Riches Within Your Reach by Robert Collier, another very precious book that can serve you well. I shall read to you first from chapter 9, and you are welcome to take notes. This chapter is called In the Beginning. For life is the mirror of king and slave. Tis just what we are and do. Then give to the world the best you have, and the best will come back to you. We often speak of psychology and metaphysics as new sciences, and think that the study of these began within the last half century. Yet if you refer to the very first book of the Bible, you find more profound examples of applied psychology than in any textbook of today. Take the story of Jacob, for instance. You remember how Jacob agreed to serve Laban seven years for the hand of Rachel in marriage, and how through the guile of his father-in-law, Jacob had to serve a second seven years. Even then, when he would have gone back to his own country, Laban begged him to tarry yet a while longer and agreed to pay Jacob as wages all the speckled and spotted cattle and all the brown cattle among the sheep and the speckled and spotted among the goats. Since Laban first removed from the herds all cattle of this kind, the chances of Jacob's getting rich on the speckled offspring of solid colored cattle seemed poor indeed. But Jacob evidently knew his scriptures and the idea we think so new that first comes the word or mental image, then the physical manifestation, was in his mind even when he made the bargain. For what did he do? This is the story then of Jacob, which Mark Prophet used to tell very often. He never quite revealed all the mysteries of this story. Perhaps you can list them for yourself. And Jacob took him rods of green poplar and of the hazel and chestnut tree and peeled white strakes in them and made the white appear which was in the rods. And he set the rods which he, which he had peeled before the flocks in the gutters in the watering troughs when the flocks came to drink that they should conceive when they came to drink. And the flocks conceived before the rods and brought forth cattle ring-straked, speckled, and spotted. And Jacob did separate the lambs and set the faces of the flocks toward the ring-straked, and all the brown in the flock of Laban. And he put his own flocks by themselves and put them unto Laban's cattle. As it came to pass, whensoever the stronger cattle did conceive, that Jacob laid the rods before the eyes of the cattle in the gutters, that they might conceive among the rods. But when the cattle were feeble, he put them not in. So the feebler were Laban's and the stronger Jacob's. And the man increased exceedingly and had much cattle and maidservants and men servants and camels and asses. The point of the story here is that two things happen to the cattle at the watering troughs. They take in water and they conceive. Jacob knew that what their eyes rested upon and what their thoughts meditated upon, even at the level of cattle and sheep and goats, while they conceived, would be transmitted to their offspring. So he outsmarted the geneticist of his future father-in-law, and he himself demonstrated this ancient principle no doubt that came down to them from Atlantis. Furthermore, he practiced the art of selection 
and use the stronger ones to propagate in this manner. You have heard of the English cuckoo, too lazy to rear and care for its own young. It goes to the nests of other birds when they are off seeking food, notes the markings on their eggs, then comes back later and lays in their nest eggs of those same exact markings. Various saints of the Middle Ages are said to have had markings on their hands, feet, and sides, similar to those on the crucified Savior, acquired from constant contemplation of his image. And only recently I read of an adopted child which was reported to have developed markings similar in all respects to those of the real son of its foster parents. Although the son had died some months before the adopted child was born. The parents were satisfied it was a case of reincarnation, but it seemed to me merely a materialization in the foster child of the images in the mother's mind. She had grieved inexpressibly over her loss. She had adopted the waif to try to fill the void left by her own little boy, and striving to see in his every action some reminder of her lost one, those images so strongly held in her mind actually expressed themselves in the body of her foster child. Whether it was reincarnation or not, it certainly had a lot to do with the magnetic pull of this mother. It all comes back to that first line of the first chapter of the Gospel of St. John. In the beginning was the word. For what is a word? A mental image, is it not? Before an architect can build a house, he must have a mental image of what he is to build. Before you can accomplish anything, you must have a clear mental image of what it is you want to do. That is the crux of the entire lesson this evening. You must have a clear mental image of what it is you want to do. I remind you that we cannot simply decree into the air, but we must decree directly to the eye of God, send our visualization to the eye of God, and the eye of God will send back that visualization to materialize it in concrete form. If we have no particular wish, no particular desire, no particular focus of our decrees, and just call for the will of God, we will get much less for our effort than if we pray earnestly to Saint Germain, follow the methods of his alchemy course, and make a step-by-step -step plan of what it is we are to our picture. So, as we read here, turn to the scriptural account of the creation of the world. What is the outstanding fact you find there? In everything God created, the word came first, then the material form. Notice that the author has already defined the word as a mental picture or a mental image. We think of the word as a fiat, as the power of God. We define the word as the Shakti, the Divine Mother through whom the creation is manifest. This takes that concept another step further, that the word that goes forth is not only the sound of the I am that I am, but it is a clear mental image, almost like a woodcut, a very definite mental image that is clear and precise and very specific in its detail. And God said, let there be light, and God said, let there be a firmament, and God said, let us make man. I want to point out to you that the word let means allow. Allow the energy to flow forth from above. Allow the all-seeing eye of God to see it allow yourself to see it to send it to god god sends it back to you from his i am presence and bounces it off the subconscious i've spoken of the subconscious as a trampoline and the subconscious as a mirror let is very important it is the word of elohim which is the plural noun for the father mother god when we say let each one of us can say that instantaneously we are tying into the great causal body of ourselves and our twin flame let us can only refer to you 
with your twin flame created out of God in the beginning. First the word, then the material form. Let us remember then that the very first person in our mastermind alliance is the mighty I am presence and holy Christ self of our twin flame. I didn't say that the first person of your mastermind alliance is your twin flame because you know not the condition of that twin flame. That twin flame could be in a negative spiral and therefore to try to be one with that twin flame at the human level could be self-defeating to both of you. You may be the one that has the greater positive spiral therefore you can draw on the great causal body the I am presence the Holy Christ self of the twin flame and wait until you have proof that that one in manifestation somewhere is in a positive spiral before you seek to unite at that level alliances liaisons and marriages with the twin flame do not work unless they are both in the positive spiral there is nothing automatic about a twin flame relationship yet you have that claim to the causal body and you should affirm it when you go about your alchemy. Scientists tell us that words denote ideas, mental concepts, that you can always judge how far a race has advanced in the mental scale by the number of words it uses. Its vocabulary is the measure of its ideas. Few words, few ideas, few mental images. Therefore, when God said, let the earth bring forth grass, he had in mind a clear mental image of what grass was like. And think of the many kinds of grasses that grow upon this planet. I am continually amazed as I walk through our forests at the many types and classifications of grasses. And I really didn't become aware of these until one day I walked through with a specialist in that which grows in this area who named for me right within my range about 10 different types of grasses without even taking a footstep it was like when I was a child and an internationally famous ornithologist a woman of great wisdom and great love of birds used to come and visit our home and my parents who had been acquainted when they were in South America and this woman was selected to go along because of her international acclaim in the knowledge of birds. I used to think there were about two or three kinds of birds at the seashore. She went down to the seashore and, and identified at least 25 different kinds of birds immediately where I had only seen at least three different kinds or a minimum of three kinds. And so we realized that the imaging of the archetype of the bird and then the classification of birds is in the power of Elohim, in the power of the mind of God. If we want a particular bird and a particular grass, we will have to name it. And that is why we have bit kits for our children. A little bit of the intelligence of the mind of God, as Mark referred to these bits. Children will readily remember every type of grass if you make them a set of bit kits on all the different grasses with their pictures and with their names. They are not limited to the word grass, but we have become so. It is like the blurring of our vision because we have not been taught to really use our eyes or our third eye as children to image forth. But how can we image forth if we do not see clearly? So we must look at things all around us and practice taking in the detail so that when we wish to be co-creators with Elohim, we will have that detail inside of our minds, that great geometry of God, and be able to be very specific in our precipitation. When God said, let the earth bring forth grass, he had in mind a clear mental image of what grass was like. In other words, he had already formed the mold he had already formed the mold. Because it is so difficult for us to form molds, we use everything available to us, pictures, newspapers, magazines, and we cut out very precise images. And that helps us to precipitate what we want. 
As the scriptures put it, the Lord God made the earth and the heavens and every plant of the field before it was in the earth, and every herb of the field before it grew. I'm grateful this author has brought this to our attention because the etheric matrix was set. God set the etheric matrix as a giant grid. And when he said, let there be light, and the light passed through this grid, the light went from the alpha to the omega and was manifest in manifestation according to the shape it took passing through the grid, the image, the matrix, the mold of the mind of God. He made the mental image, the mold. It needed then only to draw upon the energy about him to fill that mold and give it material form. And that is all you too need to do to give your word of power material form. First make the mental image, the mold, then pour into it the elements necessary to make that image manifest for all to see. Once we create the mental image, we want to see it physically. We paint it, we cut it out, we photograph it, but we bring it together, and then we practice the science of creation, which is the science of repetition. We come back to it regularly, at the most receptive times in our consciousness, when the subconscious mind is in greater control than the conscious mind, just before we go to sleep at night, and just when we awaken in the morning. That is why the bedroom walls are the place for the images that you wish to bring forth in your life and surely the place to put your treasure map. First to make the mental image, the mold, then pour into it the elements necessary to make that image manifest for all to see. What do you want first? Health, happiness, riches. I believe you want those things in that order. If you do not have perfect health, you do not have the ability to serve your God, or even the strength to be happy, or the will to have abundance. Therefore, if we want health, we will get it. If we want happiness, we will get it. If we want riches, especially riches of the spirit, we will get them too. For perfect health, begin by taking the life out of every distorted image of sickness or imperfection. See yourself drawing it out, withdrawing the energy from the imperfect matrix as by a mighty suction cup. You simply magnetized it out of it and demagnetized that form of any life you have given it. Charge those nerve centers of yours to withdraw their supporting hands and let your image of disease collapse like the pricked bubble it is. Cut the vine from the plant. Dig out the root of the weed. Destroy the matrix and no light from your I am presence can fill it. Then image the perfect mold of whatever organ has been diseased. This is why it is good for us to have bit kits for our children of the parts of the body in detail, all of the organs, in their perfected state, but in great detail. So that any time there is a problem, that child throughout his life will have the perfect visualization of that organ. I don't particularly have that visualization myself, but I intend to get it. Image the perfect mold of it so vividly that you can clearly see it in your mind's eye. Then charge the God in you to reach out with its millions of hands for all the elements it needs to make that perfect image manifest. Have no sense of limitation whatsoever. You are most beloved of God. You are a co-creator with God. God is just waiting for you to enjoy the experimentation with his light and energy and consciousness and bringing it into form. We have to walk out of the mold of homo sapiens, of the human creation, of the carnal mind and its limitations. First the word, the mental image, then the creation. But the creation will never become manifest without 
faith. Faith is a very powerful presence, but each time we attempt to create, the force plays the notes of doubt and fear that are in the subconscious. The recording, just like on a player piano, that plays off the same old melancholy tune, and it comes from the mass consciousness, it comes from the collective unconscious, and we have to understand that though we be beings of great faith in the moment of precipitation of great things the doubts and fears of the subconscious the unconscious the doubts and fears of elementals of discarnates of the mass consciousness of doubt and fear will assail us it is the nature of life in the earth and as i said recently to you every day is a test of rejecting negative spirals and being that pillar of fire that God has thrust into the earth, being that mighty sword that he has thrust into the earth and said, here am I in this my beloved son, here am I in this my beloved daughter, I will be who I am, I am who I am. This I am that I am gathers more of itself around you. You come into form and manifestation. You have this wondrous body and soul and spirit and heart and mind. And so you are a pillar of alpha in the earth and the negative charge, the misuses of the light of omega will come into you just like energy rushes into a vortex, into a, a water that is going down a drain. And so when that comes, we must instantly transmute it, reverse it, and turn it into the positive power. It's like seizing from the enemy the power that he would use to destroy you before he can release it. It is verily the Tai Chi of the abundant life. The seizing that energy and turning it right back into a positive spiral. So this is what happens when you raise up that great star of faith where you are. So when you have made your image, when you have set the God in you to work pouring it into the elements it needs for life, believe that you receive. Why, of course you receive. And you remember and you say into the teeth of every devil, it is the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. It is my Father's good pleasure to give me the kingdom. The kingdom is his consciousness and his consciousness materialized right where I am. See with the eyes of your mind that perfect organ functioning as it was meant to and thank God for it. For riches the same principle holds true. Take your life out of every image of debt, of lack, of unfulfilled obligation. The God in you is a God of plenty. He cannot owe money. He cannot be limited. There are no circumstances powerful enough to force him to live in poverty or want. You'll soon be receiving St. Germain's Pearl of Wisdom where he gives us the mandate to pay our debts. Therefore, we must make fiats out of these lines. I am taking my life out of every image of debt, of lack, of unfulfilled obligation together. I am taking my life out of every image of debt, of lack, of unfulfilled obligation. In the name of my mighty I am presence and holy Christ self, I am taking my life out of every image of debt, of lack, of unfulfilled obligation. Do you mean it? Yes! I can hardly hear you. Yes. Jump to your feet, shout it to your mighty I am presence. In the name of my mighty I am presence and holy Christ self, I take my life out of every image of death, of lack, of unfulfilled obligation. In the name of my mighty I am presence and holy Christ self, the God in me is a God of plenty. In the name of my mighty I am presence and holy Christ self, the God in me is a God of plenty. In the name of my mighty I am presence and holy Christ self, the God in me is a God of plenty. In the name of my mighty I am presence and holy Christ self, the God in me is a God of plenty. 
in the name of my mighty I am presence and holy Christ self the God in me cannot owe money in the name of my mighty I am presence and holy Christ self the God in me cannot owe money he cannot be limited he cannot be limited there are no circumstances powerful enough to force him to live in poverty or want there are no circumstances powerful enough to force him to live in poverty or want. Thank you. Please be seated. Yet he, remember, is devoted entirely to your advancement. So how can you be tied down by debt or limitation of any kind? If you feel you have misused your funds or another's, or spent funds unwisely as God would not direct you to do, immediately call upon the law of forgiveness. Tell God that you are sorry that you have done these things. Perhaps, perhaps you acted in spiritual blindness or selfishness or in a sense of desire for material things that you do not need, truly do not need to fulfill God's divine plan. You must not go around with a sense of guilt I am in debt, woe is me, because I have sinned and I have bought these things that I don't need. I've invested unwisely. I've wasted the money God gave me. Now look at the mess I've made of my life. Well, that's a nice big rock of condemnation of the black magicians upon you. But the real key here to your supply is that if you cannot ask for forgiveness and receive it, that means you are too proud, too proud to let God forgive you. Too proud to accept a gift from God. You're like Cain. You want to do it all yourself and you want to take all the credit yourself for your sins as well as your successes. So it takes that point of humility. I come across people now and then who say I just cannot forgive myself for this terrible thing I did. They'll even say to me, I know you've forgiven me, mother. I know God has forgiven me, but I just can't forgive myself. Well, who do you think you are that you can't forgive yourself when God has forgiven you? And when the messenger has assured you that God has forgiven you and has personally forgiven you. You see, we do these things because the force tricks us. It is the fallen angels who will never, for, never accept God's forgiveness. Don't you realize that? That is why they will never bend the knee. First of all, they will never admit they are wrong. They will never ask for forgiveness because they have done wrong, because they can do no wrong. This is a very bad trait of the carnal mind. If you see it in yourself, root it out. Because you do not want to have anything in yourself that is akin to the fallen angels. So whatever mess you have made of your finances so far, if you have, tonight is the night to call upon the law of forgiveness and know that your Father, Mother God loves you and will forgive you because your Father, Mother God did forgive the prodigal son. We are all prodigal sons and daughters when we are in the mode of going out from the central sun until we turn and face that sun 100%, 1000%. I am going back to God no matter what, no matter what I have to do. So forgiveness is the key to supply. And if we will go to the lengths to accept God's forgiveness of ourselves when we feel so unworthy, we must claim the worthiness of God and ourselves as the mirror image of it. In the name of my mighty I am presence, I claim the worthiness of God and myself as the mirror image of it. In the name of my mighty I am presence and holy Christ self, I claim the worthiness of God and my mirror image of it. You are made in the image and likeness of God. And your power is to be this giant mirror. That's what your soul is. A giant mirror of God. Keep the mirror polished. Look in the mirror and see God's face smiling at you and return that smile. Be that mirror image of God. Every time you get into a negative spiral, things get cloudy, you get a sense of injustice, you get annoyed, something pops up out of the unconscious, 
you're annoyed with this or that when you were seemingly at peace you have to remember to polish the mirror and mirror the image of God and then all that power of your mighty I am presence takes dominion over the untransmuted self and you can rejoice and live in happiness because you are constantly mirroring God by constantly mirroring God you balance karma but you do so in the state of God consciousness God self-awareness you now are aware of yourself as the image and likeness of God his mirror image so I think in answer to the question so how can you be tied down by debt or limitation of any kind I think the how can you be is this non-forgiveness when you don't forgive yourself you don't forgive others and that is the hook of criticism condemnation and judgment you may not even be aware of this of the fact that you have not forgiven yourself but if you continually criticize yourself allow the force to make you revolve the old patterns and the old images of the old self you deprive El Moria of Achila and it is a cosmic crime an absolute cosmic crime to allow yourself or the force to continually play the old movies you must speak to the force and say my God has forgiven me I accept that forgiveness and I forgive myself and I am so grateful for this forgiveness that I will hold nothing against anyone in the entire cosmos I forgive all all wrongs they have ever done me for God has given to me back my life by his forgiveness of me a wrong that I could not have conceived that he would forgive me of the answer the author gives to this question how can you be tied down by debt or limitation of any kind he says how because you have insisted upon it it's almost as if the state of debt and limitation had become a security it makes you secure because you know your bounds and boundaries okay I'm a debtor okay I'm limited mighty I am presence cancel out those affirmations because you have insisted upon it instead of God instead of a God of plenty you have worshipped one of want instead of reaching out for what you needed you have tied the hands of the God in you and tried to do their work with the paltry powers of your material hands this is a state of martyrdom and the devil comes along and tells you you have to be a martyr you have to bear all this negativity because you're some kind of a world savior and you're bearing world karma and this is the via dolorosa that you have to walk there's some kind of distorted and warped spiritual pride that has to do with psychological problems in this as though we were fated and cursed by the fallen angels and we accepted their curse and that's exactly what has happened and the fallen angels are not our gods but we have to tell ourselves that often tying the hands of God so that we could be in martyrdom it's not fair to God it's not fair to ourselves it's not fair to the ascended masters because we do not prove the teaching that we love so much when we maintain this state unloose the God in you give him a job and set him to work how about it <laughs> make your mental image of the great business or other service you long for then set the God in you to work bringing to you every element you need to make that image real and don't wait until you receive the whole of it but as fast as any element becomes manifest use it if you have only 10 cents use it to start your great idea if you have only the idea start it even though you can take only the first step first the word remember then the creation and there can be no creation without faith well you have all the faith in the world and then you go and tell your little plan or your big plan to somebody and the first thing they say that's ridiculous that won't work forget it did they puncture your balloon did all your faith go out well you have to watch it you've got to have faith stronger than 25 or 50 or a thousand people telling you it can't be done 
Show your faith by using each element as fast as it makes itself manifest, even though there be no sign that any other element is following, and before you know it, your whole structure will be complete. Have you ever read Genevieve Barron's account of how she got $20,000, when from all material points of view, her chances of ever seeing that amount of money were just about nil? No. <laughs> we haven't read that account. <laughs> Every night before going to sleep, she writes, in your invisible power, I made a mental picture of the desired 20,000, which seemed necessary to go and study with Troward. Twenty imaginary $1,000 bills were counted over each night in my bedroom. And then with the idea of more emphatically impressing my mind with the fact that this $20,000 was for the purpose of going to England and studying with Troward, I wrote out my picture saw myself buying my steamer ticket, walking up and down the ship's deck from New York to London, and finally saw myself accepted as Troward's pupil. This process was repeated every morning and every evening, always impressing more and more fully upon my mind. Troward's memorized statement, my mind is a center of divine operations. In the name of my mighty I am presence and holy Christ self, my mind is a center of divine operations. I endeavored to keep this statement in the back part of my consciousness all the time with no thought in mind of how the money might be obtained. Probably the reason why there was no thought of the avenues through which the money might reach me was because I could not possibly imagine where the $20,000 would come from. So I simply held my thoughts steady and let the power of attraction find its own way and means. That's one way to do it. Don't not make your treasure map and don't not visualize your money because you can't think of how you personally are going to get it. Remember, the God in you is waiting for you to put him to work to get that money for you and for us to pay all of our bills and have abundant left over to finish the projects we have started. We accept that done right now with full power. That's right. Genevieve Barron continues. One day while walking on the street, taking deep breathing exercises, the thought came, my mind is surely a center of divine operation. If God fills all space, then God must be in my mind also. If I want this money to study with Troward that I may know the truth of life, then both the money and the truth must be mine. Though I am unable to feel or see the physical manifestations of either, Still, I declared, it must be mine. In the name of my mighty I am presence and holy Christ self, the dollars we need to pay back debts by the end of the years must be ours. In the name of my mighty I am presence and holy Christ self, the dollars we need to pay back debts by the end of the year must be ours. Now what we have to do is keep the concentration of our minds upon our purpose and our goal. And what happens? All kinds of curveballs come in, self-concerns, worries, self-pity, fears that are foes and has, have no absolute reality whatsoever to steal our energy, distract us, get us upset, get the emotional body churning. And then what happens? We've forgotten all about the, the fact that we're in the process of being alchemists and drawing forth this energy for a divine purpose. It takes definite discipline of mind and emotions because the entire planetary force of the sinister force will attack you in the midst of your alchemy, will cloud your mirror, will trouble the waters of your emotional body, will confuse and distort the very precise thoughts of your mind. So please don't let yourself forget that you are on a mission of alchemy, not just to gain health, happiness, and riches, but to gain your adeptship. You are doing this to prove your adeptship, that you can work with fire, air, water, and earth, with all the elementals. They will obey your command, and you will bring forth those things that are necessary to fulfill our divine plan. Think about this for a moment. Close your eyes and steal your mind on the third eye and focus your visualization and look in your hands and see whatever amount of money you believe 
can come through you to Church Universal and Triumphant. See your hands receiving it now and the God within you going to work to get it from this moment forward and having the energy to do it and the channels open to him through you because you allow it, because you say to God, let there be money in my hands. In other words, you're saying, my twin flame and I and our causal body are allowing the light and energy and consciousness of our causal body to precipitate this supply which we need to fulfill our divine plan. And you absolutely do need it because you need to have your twin flame fulfill that divine plan as much as you need to fulfill your divine plan, even if that twin flame is ascended. Your ascended twin flame needs funds on earth in your hands to complete that plan. Gen Genevieve Behrend continues, while these reflections were going on in my mind, there seemed to come up from within me the thought, I am all the substance there is. In the name of my mighty I am presence and holy Christ self, right where I am, I am all the substance there is. I am all the substance there is. I am all the substance there is. I have no lack and no want, for lack and want are an absence of God's substance, and I am all the God's substance there is. Then from another channel in my brain, the answer seemed to come. Of course, that's it. Everything must have its beginning in mind. The idea must contain within itself the only one and primary substance there is, and this means money as well as everything else. My mind accepted this idea, and immediately all the tension of mind and body was relaxed. There was a feeling of absolute certainty of being in touch with all the power life has to give. I would like to point out to you that those who are well off and those who are not show themselves visibly. If you are astute, you can see that those who have plenty of money do not have a tensed muscle in their faces. They have a certain peace and relaxation of confidence that they have the supply they need. Those who are poor tend to have tension in the body and in the face. And of course, that tension, which is the sense of want or lack, the absence of the abundance of God, that begets greater want, lack, and poverty. She goes on, all thought of money, teacher, or even my own personality vanished in the great wave of joy which swept over my entire being. I walked on and on with his feeling of joy steadily increasing and expanding until everything about me seemed aglow with resplendent light. Every person I passed appeared illuminated as I was. All consciousness of personality had disappeared and in its place there came that great and almost overwhelming sense of joy and contentment. The joy of completeness, the joy that in my mighty I am presence where I am that I am, I am all the substance there is. And there is no want, there is no lack, there is no poverty, there is no indebtedness, for these things are the absence of that substance. I am in the all in all, the all in all is in me. I am the fullness of the abundant life. God is my mind and that universal mind is in every pore and cell and atom of my being. God is universal, divine, spiritual, material substance, and I am that substance and the fullness of that substance manifesting in me now. And I give it, and I break the bread of life, and I give it unto others and to all life. I share all that I am in God with every other part of life who is God. That night when I made my picture of the $20,000,
it was with an entirely changed aspect. On previous occasions when making my mental picture, I had felt that I was waking up something within myself. This time there was no sensation of effort. I simply counted over the $20,000. Then in a most unexpected manner from a source of which I had no consciousness at the time, there seemed to open a possible avenue through which the money might reach me. Just as soon as there appeared a circumstance which indicated the direction through which the $20,000 might come, I not only made a supreme effort to regard the indicated direction calmly as the first sprout of the seed I had sown in the absolute, but left no stone unturned to follow up that direction, thereby fulfilling my part. By so doing, one circumstance seemed naturally to lead to another until step by step my desired $20,000 was secured. My beloved hearts, we can do the same, and it can be 20 million, taking care of all of our debts, all of Glastonbury debts, all debts of keepers of the flame. Do you believe it? Yes. yes. Let's do it. It takes concentration and focus, imaging and visualization. You have to walk and live and breathe this. And do you know what your burning desire must be? The burning desire to be one with Brahman and the word in the beginning. And to establish the proof of this theorem to manifest the materialization of that God flame so that all things that come into your hands are not sought for the thing in itself, but are sought for the living mastery of the God flame, whereby we prove his law, we are in alignment with him, and when called upon, we can help others who are needy because they are in a state of the consciousness of neediness and lack and want. And we are grateful that their cups are empty, that we might fill them with that joy and not let someone else fill their cups with greed and doubt and fear and all these things. For happiness the method is no different. Your God is a God of love and real love can know no unhappiness. For love gets its happiness from giving. There are laws to interfere with almost every other activity of humanity but none to keep you from giving as much as you like. An unselfish giving results in getting, just as surely as planting results in harvesting. Give with no thought of reward, but the good of the one you are helping, and good is bound to flow back to you. Love begets love, you know. So take your life out of every thought of enmity, of repining, of unhappiness. In place of these, see yourself in your mind's eye, giving every manner of happiness to all whom you would have love you. Image that in your mind's eye, then set the God in you to work. Set the God in, work, in you to work. Beloved, mighty I am presence and holy Christ self, I am setting you to work in me and through me this day for the victory of church universal and triumphant of every light bearer in this cosmos and all the supply we need to convey that knowledge and that teaching, that hope, that faith, that charity to all of those who are lost in the astral plane and even in this very moment in the grips of the sinister force. I say let the blue lightning of the mind of God explode in this moment of that strangle hold that the sinister force would have upon the children of the light in this earth. Let them be cut free by the mighty sword of the angel of the Lord. I accept it on this hour in full power through the mighty I am presence, the holy Christ self in me, whom I put to work in this moment to go forth now to bind all opposition to the light bearers, to set the captives free that they might sacrifice unto God. And I accept this in the name Jesus Christ. Lord Maitreya Gautama Buddha Sanat Kumara Padma Sambhava and the entire cosmos of light, light, light. Therefore we say together, I am light, glowing light, radiating light, intensifying light. God consumes my darkness, transmuting it into light. This day I am a focus of the central sun. Flowing through me is a crystal river, a living fountain of light. 
that can never be qualified by human thought and feeling. I am an outpost of the divine. Such darkness as has used me is swallowed up by the mighty river of light which I am. I am, I am, I am light. I live, I live, I live in light. I am light's fullest dimension. I am light's purest intention. I am light, 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 lighting the world everywhere I move, blessing, strengthening, and conveying the purpose of the kingdom of heaven. I am light, glowing light, radiating light, intensified light. God consumes my darkness, transmuting it into light. This day I am a focus of the central sun. Flowing through me is a crystal river, a living fountain of light that can never be qualified by human thought and feeling. I am an outpost of the divine. Such darkness as has used me is swallowed up by the mighty river of light, which I am. I am, I am, I am light. I live, I live, I live in light. I am light's fullest dimension. I am light's purest intention. I am light, 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 flooding the world everywhere I move, blessing, strengthening, and conveying the purpose of the kingdom of heaven. I am light, glowing light, radiating light, intensified light. God consumes my darkness, transmuting it into light. This day I am a focus of the central sun. Flowing through me is a crystal river, a living fountain of light that can never be qualified by human thought and feeling. I am an outpost of the divine. Such darkness as has used me is swallowed up by the mighty river of light which I am. I am, I am, I am light. I live, I live, I live in light. I am light's fullest dimension. I am light's purest intention. I am light, 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 flooding the world everywhere I move. Blessing, strengthening, and conveying the purpose of the kingdom of heaven. I am light, glowing light, radiating light, intensified light. God consumes my darkness, transmuting it into light. This day I am a focus of the central sun. Flowing through me is a crystal river, a living fountain of light that can never be qualified by human thought and feeling. I am an outpost of the divine. Such darkness as has used me is swallowed up by the mighty river of light, which I am. I am, I am, I am light. I live, I live, I live in light. I am light's fullest dimension. I am light's purest intention. I am light, 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 flooding the world. Blessing, strengthening, and conveying the purpose of the kingdom of heaven. Image that in your mind's eye, then set the God in you to work, bringing you opportunities to make all these loved ones happier. In place of all enmity, repining of unhappiness, See yourself in your mind's eye giving every manner of happiness to all whom you would have love you. Image that in your mind's eye. Then set the God in you to work, bringing you opportunities to make all these loved ones happier. And as fast as each opportunity presents itself, use it. No matter how tiny an opportunity it may be, use it. No matter if it be merely the chance to say a pleasant word, to give a kindly smile, to bring a happy thought, use it. And in the using you will find that doubly great happiness has come to you. Each of us is a miniature sun, his circumstances and surroundings his solar system. If debts and disease and troubles form part of your system, what is the remedy? Let go of them, of course. If you want new planets of riches and youth and happiness, how can you get them? In the same way the sun does, and only in that way, by throwing off from yourself. Remember this, nothing can come into your solar system except from you or through you. If it comes from outside, it is not yours and has no power over you until you take hold of it mentally and accept it as yours. It is best then at this stage of the game and on the path to see your astrology as initiation rather than karma. It may be karma, but let yourself transmit, translate it into initiation.
For as initiation, you will clearly accept the positive and clearly transmute the negative and not see yourself victims. I do not like to get letters from people telling me what their astrological afflictions are and therefore why they are having a hard time. I think it's a cop-out and a betrayal of the Ascended Master's teachings and surely not the reason why our beloved El Moria has given us the opportunity to calculate the returning cycles of karma. Surely it is because we are going to pass our tests. I tell you, people with no Ascended Master teachings and no astrology teaching will have the same afflictions as you and they will go out and fight and overcome because that's just the kind of people they are. So what do we have to say for ourselves when we have a precise math mathematical calculation of when we will have an affliction of Neptunian delusion and then we sit there and say, well, I'm under this now and so I'm having a hard time and when this passes by, I'll be fine again. Well, you'll never be fine again because there's always something negative in an astrological chart every day of your life. There's rarely a perfect chart. So the only reason you look at life this way is that somehow you've got negative spirals in your being. Is it the superconscious mind, the conscious, the subconscious, the unconscious? It's one of the four lower bodies or all of them. It can be the yin state from eating. It can be the yin state from sugar and all of those things. But if you accept negativity as belonging to you, it will stick to you like glue. And you really must create your own constellations, put them in place, you know, Nobody ever said you can only have one treasure map. We should start with one, but you can have a separate treasure map where you see yourself in the center of a sun and you take the pictures of the masters in place of the planets and you put them in orbit around you. And you fill the rings around you, just like the rings around an electron, with all the pictures of the ascended masters and you welcome their causal body each and every day superimposed over the causal body of that planet or that configuration. It's really important that you get on the track of creating all the positives in your life and all the positive mental images, the mental thought form, and that you stop allowing any others to manifest or giving yourself any excuse whatsoever for negativity because you have your mighty I am presence in you. So there is no more excuse for the absence of anything. So if you don't want a certain configuration, you can refuse to accept it, refuse to take hold of it, refuse to believe in its reality, then put in the place it seems to occupy the perfect condition of your own imaging. This does not mean you negate the responsibilities of karma or the responsibilities of initiation. It does not mean that the Lord God will not test you. And if he allowed Satan to test Job, he just may allow the fallen angels to gather around you to test you and see if you're going to be true in the cosmic honor flame and not be compromised by them. But the way to conquer is to put in position your positive spirals and live by them. And that positive thrust and energy will simply thrust from you any inroads of negativity that people like to project your way and plug into you. Just remember your vulnerabilities are the negative programming of the Nephilim, parents, authority figures, and others. These you must root out, and that's why you must read the psychology books I have listed for you in our latest Keepers of the Flame lesson. If there is something lacking in your solar system, you have only to speak the word Create the mental image, then hold to that image in serene faith until the God in you has filled it with those elements that make it visible to all. Remember the key word, let there be light, let there be peace, let there be abundance, let there be love, let there be supply, let there be the specific manifestation of this thing, O God, in thy name. Let, that's what opens the flood tides of light and remember when you say let, to have as well defined a mental image as you can conjure up so it takes the form and manifests precisely. It is your own fault when you allow yourself to become the victim of personal impotence or of undesirable external situations. As Emerson put it, nothing external to you has any power over you. 
It only has the power that you give it. Those latter words are mine. The scriptures say, let no man take thy crown. The only man that can take your crown from you is you. When you realize that, you will stop blaming persons, places, and circumstances, molding factors, heredity factors. Nothing can take from you your crown. In the name of my mighty I am presence and holy Christ self, no man shall take my crown. In the name of my mighty I am presence and holy Christ self, no man shall take my crown. And that means you, dweller on the threshold. That means you, carnal mind. That means you, untransmuted karma. You will not take from me my crown. You fear these negative seemings simply because you believe in them. And do you know what belief in negatives is? Belief is the wrong word. The word is superstition. People are very superstitious about their negatives. They give them this enormous power because superstition is fear. It's another name for fear. You're superstitious about this, so you won't walk on that side of the street. You know, a black cat crosses your path. You don't believe in superstition, but you take note of it. Hmm, what's going to happen to me today? A black cat walked by. You give belief to that matrix of the black cat, and pretty soon he's as big as the sky, clouding your whole day. Because you believe in them, when all the time it is only that belief that gives them power and authority because they have no power and you just gave them your energy from your tree of life and ensouled and made that black cat the enemy to be feared. Remember you are the central sun of your own solar system. You have dominion over everything within that system. You can say what shall enter, what shall stay there. And you have infinite attractive power to draw to you anything of good you may desire. Nothing stands between you and your fondest desires but lack of understanding of or faith in this power of attraction. The power of attraction is the power of your threefold flame, your heart chakra, and every other chakra. You've got seven magnets of attraction, even as they release the light of God. You've got your mighty I am presence, which is the great central sun magnet. But once you send out the desire, you must have perfect faith in the result. And if you are really an ascended master Chila, you will see to it that the desire is purified and perfected else you will have the accountability of negative karma. You cannot accomplish anything by expressing a desire and then spending your time fearing and worrying lest you will not find the work you seek or not have the money and time to pay your bills or that some other evil thing will happen to prevent good from coming to you. The law of attraction cannot bring both good and evil at the same time. It must be one or the other and it is up to you to decide which it shall be. After any object or purpose is clearly held in thought, says Lillian Whiting, its precipitation in tangible and visible form is merely a question of time. Columbus saw and vision a path through trackless waters around the world. The vision always precedes and itself determines the realization. I dare you to say, every day and every way I am getting richer and richer. In the name of my mighty I am presence and holy Christ self, every day in every way I am getting richer and richer. Always be certain that you see the, spe the sphere, the giant sphere of the great spirit universe above you, let's say from the heart up, and the giant sphere of the matter universe below you. So when you speak of riches, you are seeing coming to yourself the balance of spiritual treasures and wisdom and all the virtues of God with their corresponding materialization in the matter universe of the abundance of every good and perfect gift that you need to be successful as a chila. If you dare to say this, then we'll follow up the word with a mental image of yourself having all the riches you desire Spirit substance will make your word manifest and show you the way to riches. And spirit substance does this by the mighty figure eight flow from that 
that figure eight back again. So the spiritual energy descends through the nexus of your Christ mind into spiritual manifestation and those atoms and electrons keep flowing back to the spirit and back into the form again. So you are continually vitalizing your materializations with that light and energy. You were designed by the Father to be master of your fate and captain of your soul. If you are not exercising that mastery, it is because you are lying down on the job. Instead of mastering your thoughts and mental images, you are letting them bow down before mere things, or mere persons, or mere circumstances of karma, or mere conditions of life, or mere hereditary factors. Whatever the mere is, that's the problem. Instead of mastering your thoughts and mental images, you are letting them bow down before mere things. That's in violation of the first commandment. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. And those mere things, those mere little silly problems, are the gods because they occupy your minds more time than God does. No thing can make you unhappy if you will exercise your divine power of love and blessings toward it. Everything is good in its essence, and that good essence will respond to your call of blessing, and its good will come forth to meet you. It will actually greet you in your path. The world stands out on either side, no wider than the heart is wide. Above the world is stretched the sky, no higher than the soul is high. The heart can push the sea and land farther away on either hand. The soul can split the sky in two and let the face of God shine through. Now that was chapter 9, and I'm going to sit down and read to you now chapter 10, because this is the specifics of how you do it. Very specific. There were many specifics in the previous chapter, but this is the one that I think we need to get started on, that we cannot wait another day. Even if you don't have time to paste together a whole treasure map, get a bulletin board, get some kind of board that you can tack up things. See if you can clear a wall where you sleep, put it up, and when you find the right images, tack them on the board, and then one of these days organize the thing into a concept of what you want to precipitate through those images. I feel we are all so busy, especially on staff and especially anywhere we're working in Montana, that we don't get down to the specifics of applying the step-by-step -step plan that Napoleon Hill gives. So this is Robert Collier from Rich is Within Your Reach, and I'm going to give you chapter 10. Please take notes. This is a very exciting chapter. All of us can see us in this situation, either in this life or some other embodiment. And whether or not we achieve this attainment remains to be seen. We don't know all the records of our past lives, but I dare say there is no one here, including myself, that has not lived out a lifetime in ab abject poverty, accepting that poverty as our lot because we believed that we were on the bottom rung of society and we were the poor. So here's the story. Treasure mapping for supply. It's chapter 10 and it's the test of the ten. Dwal Kul teaches us about the test of the ten in his studies, intermediate studies of the human aura. So many people have won to success and happiness by making treasure maps to more easily visualize the things they wanted that Nautilus magazine recently ran a prize competition for the best article showing how a treasure map had helped to bring about one heart's desire. Carolyn J. Drake won the contest. I had been bookkeeper, she wrote, in a large department store for seven years when the manager's niece, whose husband had just died, was put in my place. I felt stunned. My husband had died ten years previously, leaving a little home and some insurance, but sickness and hospital bills had long since taken both home and money. I had supported the family for eight years and kept the three children in school, but had not been able to save any money. The eldest child, a boy, had just finished high school, but as yet had found nothing to do to help along. Day after day I looked for work of any kind to do, which might pay rent and give us a living. 
I was 35 years old, strong, capable, and willing, but there was absolutely no place for me. For the first time in my life, I was afraid of the future. The thought that we might have to go on relief appalled me. Thus three months passed. I was behind two months with the rent when the landlord told me I would have to move. I asked him to give me a few days longer in which to try and find work. This he agreed to do. The next morning I started out again on my rounds. In passing a magazine stand, I stopped and glanced over the papers and magazines. It must have been the answer to my many prayers that led me to pick up the copy of a magazine which stared me in the face. Idly, I opened it and glanced at the table of contents. My mind was in such a turmoil that I ba was barely conscious of the words which my eyes saw. Suddenly, my eye was caught by a title about treasure mapping for success and supply. Something impelled me to buy a copy of the magazine which proved to be the turning point in our lives. Instead of looking for work, I went home. Still under the influence of that something which I did not then understand, I began to read the magazine. Strange and unreal as it then seemed, still I did not doubt. I read each article eagerly and in its order. When I came to the article about treasure mapping to bring success and supply, something about the idea seemed to hold me in its grip. As a child, I had always loved games, and this idea of making a treasure map reawakened that old desire. I read the article several times. Then, with a bunch of papers which I hunted up, I set to work to make my treasure map of success and supply. So many things came into my mind to put on that treasure map. First, there was the little cottage at the edge of town. Then there was a little dress and millinery shop which I had always longed for. Then, of course, a car. And in that cottage would be a piano for the girls, a yard in the back where we could work among the flowers of an evening or a morning. My enthusiasm grew by leaps and bounds. From magazines and papers, I cut pictures and words and sentences, all connected with the idea of success and abundance. Next, I found a large sheet of heavy white paper and began building that map. In the center, I pasted a picture of a lovely little cottage with wide porches and trees and shrubbery around it. In one corner of the map, I put a picture of a little storeroom, and underneath I pasted the words, Betty's Style Shop. Close to this, I pasted pictures of a very few sh stylish dresses and hats. At different places on the map, I placed sentiments and mottos, all carrying out the idea of success, abundance, happiness, and harmony. I do not know how long I worked on that treasure map, which was to be the means of attracting into our lives the things which we had need of and desired. I could already feel myself living in that cottage and working in the little dress shop. Never had I felt so completely fascinated and thrilled with an idea as with that treasure map and what I was sure it would bring us. I tacked the map on the wall of my bedroom right in front of my bed so that the first thing I saw in the morning and the last thing at night would be that treasure map of my desires. Every night and morning I would go over every detail of that map until it fairly seemed to become a part of my very being. It became so clear that I could call it instantly to mind at any moment in the day. Then in my silence period I would see myself and the children going through the rooms of the cottage, laughing and talking, arranging the furniture and curtains. I would picture my daughters at the piano singing and playing. I would see my son sitting in the library with books and papers all around him. Then I would picture myself walking about my shop proud and happy, people coming in and going out. I would see them buying the lovely hats and dresses, paying me for them and going out smiling. During all this time I was learning more and more of the power of the mind to draw to us the things and conditions like unto our thoughts. I understood that this treasure map was but the means of impressing upon my subconscious mind the pattern from which to build the conditions of success and harmony into our lives. Always after each of my silence periods, I would lovingly thank God that the abundance and harmony and love were already ours. I believed that I had received, for mentally living in the cottage and working in the shop was to me the certain fact that I would take possession of them in the material world just as in the mental. Isn't that what we teach? The etheric is the matrix. We step it down to the mental. The mental has to be stepped down into the desire body and the desire into the physical. For this to be stepped down, there must be successive stages of desiring. We must want the etheric matrix, and therefore we have to work with our minds to get it and form it. We have to want that mental matrix to become clothed with the desire of the mind, so we must desire it, and the desire becomes the magnet for the first side of our clock, the etheric and the mental. Then the physical becomes the vessel into which the desire body pours it, for the physical is in alignment with that 
absolute unconsciousness of the universal mind of God. When the children found out what I was doing, they entered heartily into the spirit of the game, and each of them soon had a treasure map of his own. All of you with children must give your children this teaching and joyfully, happily make a treasure map for yourself and let them make their own and don't give them a single idea or suggestion. Just give them the raw materials, stacks of magazines and newspapers and things, and let them think about what they want most and whose master's pictures and what quotes and sayings they want to put in it. Be careful not to tread upon that delicate process of the soul of the child discovering what he wants most from his Christ self. It was not many weeks before things began to happen. One day I met an old friend of my husband's and he told me that he and his wife were going west for several months and asked if we would come out and take care of their house for the rent. A week later we were settled in that cottage which was almost the very picture of the one I had on my treasure map. A little later my son was offered work evenings and Saturdays in an engineering office which proved the means of his entering college that fall. We had been in the cottage nearly two months when I saw an advertisement in the local paper for a woman to take charge of a ladies dress shop. I answered the ad and found that the owner was having to give up the shop for several months, perhaps permanently on account of her health. Arrangements were quickly made so that I was to run the business and share half the expenses and, and the profits. Within six months after we started treasure mapping for supply, we had accomplished practically everything that map called for. When the owner of the cottage came back several months later, he made it possible for us to buy the place, and we are still here. The business, too, is mine now. The lady decided not to come back, so I bought the business, paying her so much a month. It is a much larger and more thriving business now, thanks to the understanding of the power of thought which I gained through my study and practice. In another article in Nautilus, Helen, N. Helen M. Kitchell told how she used a treasure map to sell her property. She pasted an attractive picture of her house on a large sheet of paper, put a description of it underneath, and then surrounded picture and description with such mottos as, Love, the divine magnet, attracts all that is good, and others of a similar nature. She hung her map where she could see and study it several times a day and repeated some of the affirmations or mottos whenever the thought of making a sale occurred to her. She also started a little private letterbox which she called God's Box. And in it, whenever the thought occurred to her, she placed a letter written to God telling of her needs and desires. Then each month she went over the letters, taking out and giving thanks for those that had been answered. Within a year her house was sold on the very plan she herself had outlined in one of her letters to God on the exact basis and for the exact price she had asked in that letter. Another method is to talk with God. Go somewhere where you can be alone and undisturbed for a little while and talk aloud to God exactly as you would to a loving and understanding Father. Tell Him your needs. Tell Him your ambitions and desires. Describe in detail just what you want. Then thank Him just as you would an earthly Father with whom you had had a similar talk and who had promised you the things you asked for. You will be amazed at the result of such sincere talks. My word shall not come back to me void, but shall accomplish that whereunto it was sent. That is a quote from scripture. Whatever you can visualize and believe in, you can accomplish. Whatever you can see as yours in your mind's eye, you can get. In the beginning was the word. In the beginning is the mental image. Remember, the word is the mental image and the absolute all power of God to give that image life. That is the power of the word and the science of the spoken word. Corinne Wells had an article in her little magazine through rose-colored glasses that illustrates the power of visualizing your ambitions and desires. Many years ago, she says, a young girl who lived in a New York tenement was employed by a fashionable Fifth Avenue modiste to run errands match samples, and pull basting threads. Annie loved her job. From an environment of poverty, she had become suddenly and miraculously an inhabitant of an amazing new world of beauty, wealth, and fashion. It was thrilling to see lovely ladies arrive in fine carriages to watch the social elite preen before Madame's big gold-framed mirrors. 
The little errand girl in her starched gingham soon became filled with desire and fired with ambition. She began imagining herself as head of the establishment instead of its most lowly employee. Whenever she passed before mirrors, she smiled at a secret reflection she saw of herself, older and more beautiful, a person of charm and importance. At this point in the story, I must remind you of the motto of the Great White Brotherhood, to know, to dare, to do, and to be silent. The importance of keeping sealed your alchemy and your visualization cannot be overstated. Other minds of a negative spiral or in whom there may be aroused envy or jealousy or fear or doubt or threat that they are being displaced or whatever, they will cause a disintegration spiral on your alchemy. This is why you may keep this treasure map in your room. You may desire to put above it a sheet or a piece of cloth that you cover it with when you're absent in the day, if the need be to have it someplace where other people would come and go. Of course, nobody even suspected the secret existence of this make-believe person. Hugging her precious secret, Annie smiled confidently at that dazzling reflection in the mirror and began playing an exciting game. I'll pretend I'm already madam. It will, I'll be polite and look my best and have grand manners and learn something new each day. I'll work as hard and take as much interest as though the shop were really and truly mine. You know how you take care of something when it's yours as opposed to how people take care of things when it is not theirs. This we have to be careful of, especially when we have an organization, that we do not become institutionalized and we do not think, well, this is not my property, it's community or company property, so I will not take care of it as though it were my own. If you don't take care of it as though it were your own, it will never become yours. Because God gives us things on loan that are other people's. And in the measure that we care for them, for those things entrusted to our care, God will make them our own. And this he does all throughout our lives. He wants to see what we will do when we think something is not mine. Soon, fashionable ladies began whispering to Madam, Annie's the smartest girl you've ever had. Madam herself began to smile and say, Annie, you may fold Mrs. Vandergilt's gown if you'll be very careful. Or I'm going to let you deliver this wedding dress, or my dear, you're developing a real gift for color and line. And finally, I'm promoting you to the workroom. The years passed quickly. Each day, Annie came more and more to resemble the image she alone had seen of herself. You might translate this as saying that you pass by a mirror one day and you see your Holy Christ self. Or you pass by a mirror one day and you don't see your Holy Christ self and you say, my goodness, I am not reflecting my Holy Christ self. I better do something about it. Gradually, the little errand girl became Annette, an individual, then Annette, stylist, and, fi and finally, Madame Annette, renowned costume designer for a rich and famous clientele. The images we hold steadfastly in our minds over the years are not illusions. They are the patterns by which we are able to mold our own destinies. I don't know if any of you realize that Ella Wheeler Wilcox, whose poetry is quoted in this book, was the sister of Mrs. Ballard. This is her poem. You never can tell when you do an act just what the result will be. But with every deed you are sowing a seed, though the harvest you may not see. Each kindly act is an acorn dropped in God's productive soil. You may not know, but the tree shall grow with shelter for those who toil. You never can tell what your thought will do in bringing you hate or love. For thoughts are things and their airy wings are swifter than carrier doves. They follow the law of the universe. Each thing must create its kind. And they speed o'er the track to bring you back whatever went out from your mind. Riches within your reach, Robert Collier.
It belongs on your night table. These are the kinds of things that you want to make fiats out of. I gave you the example this evening of making I am affirmations out of all of the statements here that are worthwhile. You have to do that. You're the alchemist. You have to take the elements, put them together, make your own fiats and affirmations. If you do them and put them together, we can all say them, we can all use them. Make them your own, create your mantras. We have many mantras from the Ascended Masters, which we know multiply by the power of their causal bodies, our own momentums. But when you find an affirmation or a principle or a law in these books, and you know that it is that very thing that is the key to your turning of a negative spiral into a positive spiral, create your affirmation out of it and speak it into the teeth of every momentum and energy coil that comes your way to drive you back into that old negative pattern. Dismiss it with your affirmation, which you know relates to your psychology and your situation and the thing that you want to conquer. 